Hello there. Uh, Pastor Lars Hammer here from Lord of Grace Lutheran Church in Marana, Arizona. Welcome back to the Dietrich Bonhoeffer series on religionless Christianity. I sound a little bit different today. Uh, I got a little bit of a cold, so that's what's affecting my voice. Uh, today we're going to look a little bit at a new passage that we had done last week where he talks about the nature of science and secularism. So today is not going to be so much about uh, what he envisions the future church being as much as it's going to be about his analysis of the problem. What has caused us to get to this point where people are uh, living their lives without God? So. We'll start on, it would be page 325 in the book, and um, I'll move over here. We'll get the text on the screen, and uh, I'll read through that for you. Uh, are we ready? All right, here we go. Man has learned to deal with himself in all questions of importance without recourse to the working hypothesis called God. In questions of science, art, and ethics, this has become an understanding thing, an understood thing, at which one now hardly dares to tilt. But for the last hundred years or so, it has also become increasingly true of religious questions. It is becoming evident that everything gets along without God, and in fact, just as well as before. As in the scientific field, so all in the human affairs generally, God is being pushed more and more out of life, losing more and more ground. Okay, this is a little bit similar to what we had talked about a few pages past, talked about God being pushed out. Here he's reiterating that again. He's uh, revisiting that question and um, you know, acknowledging the reality. This isn't about what he wants it to be or what he'd like, but he's, you have to analyze the problem to think about a solution. And essentially he's saying here that it's funny how he calls God a working hypothesis. Uh, I think he's trying to think, put it in the terms that secular people put it in, that you know, they, don't, they wouldn't say that they experience God in an empirical way so that God's existence is a hypothesis uh, that you operate from, right? And a working hypothesis is when you have, you operate as if it were true, uh, subject to revision. All right, so this is, there's a lot in this sentence. Um, I think a lot of times in churches we don't understand really how deep secularism goes and how secularism is really a whole way of thinking and operating that is much more than just people are too lazy to get off their butts and get to church. Not that laziness is not a part of it. Uh, obviously, any organization that involves doing something that involves getting off your couch and getting into a car is going to be up against doing nothing. That's true, but we always find energy and time to do things if we find them valuable enough. And, but secularism as a, as a way of being in the world is kind of unique to the West, but its roots are not simply just pure laziness. It runs much deeper than that. And it, at its essence, deep down, it, runs, it gets to the idea of I can live life and the world operates without God. So let's look at that. Uh, he says, first, um, what are we talking about? First, uh, people live their lives without God, or they live their lives without thinking about God, and when problems come up, they don't turn to God for answers. So that was one of the big things he was talking about before, right? How the church likes to, has had historically, I think still in many ways does, carves out its turf as we, we step in where the other answers fail. Right? God is there for you when all else fails. God is there when you don't have a scientific answer. When the therapist can't fix your problem, God is there. And so God's kind of been carved out in the negative space. And what, we're, what Bonhoeffer is saying is that more and more, even when problems come up and people experience that negativi negativity or they encounter that, I guess we'll call it negative space, they're still not turning to God to fill that negative space. 
So even when problems arise, there, the old instinct was, well, if there's something, you know, we need to pray about that. We need to ask God for help with that. We need to turn to God for an answer to this problem. Nowadays, a secular person still, even when a problem occurs, they just don't turn to God for that. Uh, and, uh, you know, if there's a family problem, they'll go to a counselor or a social worker. If there's a grief problem, they'll go visit a therapist. If there's a illness, you go visit a doctor. And even if the doctor has no explanation, our instinct still is not to turn to God when there's no explanation. So that's the first thing. So if you thought people were going to come to God when they couldn't get an answer, he's saying that's not how it works. They're already not turning to God. The second thing uh, is that in general, a secular worldview views the solutions to questions and problems. They are found in the material world. So whatever thing we don't answer, they're not likely to say, you know, maybe this is because God's intervened in this thing. Uh, they still, even if they don't have the answer, will assume that a scientific materialist answer still does exist. They don't, aren't turning to God in this way. Right? Remember how I talked about the closed universe? This is one of the fundamental principles that modern science operates. It's a modern scientific working hypothesis that, that the universe exists and has its own laws and there's no evidence of a God intervening or messing or tinkering with those things or moving the things around. Every cause has an effect and every effect that you see in this world has a cause in this world. And we may not know all the answers, but the answers are there within this world. And that's the closed universe, right? There's no place for God in that universe. And liberal Christians will often agree with this, uh, and they'll agree with deists on this. And deists are the ones, who remember, God made the universe and then stepped back. So God doesn't get involved. And so God exists in the negative space outside our universe, right? After we die right, before the universe was made. But the universe that you see now is self-contained. God may be outside of it, God might be before of it, God might be after it, but God's not in it. That's the closed universe. And again, liberal Christians and deists often kind of agree on that. And they say a lot of more liberal Christians tend to function very much like secular people do. They don't go through their lives and when they encounter something say, I should turn to God for this, they still operate under a secularist principle that if something happens, there must be a material explanation for it. Um, and the second thing that you're dealing with is called the buffered self. That's a, fan, that's a term uh, that's been coined in, in analyzing secularism. And I think it's something that modern Christians, we, we have a hard, it, I don't know, it's been a good insight for us because most of us don't remember a time before secularism. Most of us are too young to remember what it was like in a world where everyone believed that everything was enchanted with spirits and demons, and your whole life could be, could be pulled one way or the other depending on which de whether you were uh, with the deity or with the demons. And so religion had a very, very realistic this world immediate need, which was to provide you regular protection from the spirits and the demons. Again, most of us go, spirits and demons? Who, who believes in that stuff anymore? In the West, that's common. In a lot of the rest of the world, it's not as common. A lot of the rest of the world still believes in spirits and demons. But nonetheless, if you take out any belief that there are evil spirits and evil demons, floating around our world, tinkering with things and messing with your life and potentially ruining things. That, and once you take that away, okay, then is there a need for a deity in this world to protect you from those things? Well, the answer would be no. If there's no spirits, I don't need a God to protect me from spirits. And so the buffered self would be the self that imagine having like a force field around you where supernatural powers simply don't interact with you. And so you don't need to pay attention to them. You can blow them off. If you would have gone back 500 years in Western Europe, there's nobody around who would have really truly believed that you could get by in this world without turning to God. Uh, because they really did believe in evil spirits. Yes, they talked a lot about heaven and hell uh, and the afterlife, but what we miss is that that was only one piece of the puzzle. The, the evil spirits were here today, right now. 
And if you didn't worship God now, there were consequences now, right? God could withdraw his favor on you. Maybe that's why you're sick, because you weren't praying enough. There were very real world consequences. Modern world, they don't even take that into account. They don't even think about that. So when you come to approach talking about religion with secular people, you're essentially talking about something that they instinctively, even if they don't articulate it, feel has no impact on their life. They're neither, God doesn't move things for good, spirits don't move things for bad, I'm not worried about the afterlife. We've kind of lost the market, is what Bonhoeffer's saying. And then he says, uh, to, we'd even get one step farther, he even says that questions of meaning now are not even making reference to God. So if people wonder, like, what is the purpose of things? What is the point? Why am I doing this? Why is there suffering in the world? The initial instinct isn't, you know, we need to turn to God to find out why there's suffering in the world. The answer is there's a material explanation, right? The gigantic earthquake that happened in Turkey, a secularist would say, has nothing to do with whether they did or did not worship God correctly. It's just plate tectonics and bad architecture, and that's all it is period, right? Most of us would probably agree with that. Do you really believe that God or God didn't intervene? Um, Syria and Turkey, very, very high religious participation. You know, it's certainly because it's, it's certainly not because they're all a bunch of atheists that God's punishing them. Uh, or if you're Pat Robertson, you can't claim that it's because of gay nightclubs or something. Uh, that's not a big thing in those areas. So, you know, they, they would just say that even when there's questions of meaning, they still aren't turning to God. People aren't turning to God, is what Bonhoeffer is saying. Uh, so, and then he says, uh, interesting thing, he says, an understood, uh, it has become an understood thing at which one now hardly dares to tilt, that, that it's, it's just so commonplace and so normal, people aren't even, people don't even question it. And if you even, even in any way try to criticize you know, this buffered self, closed universe idea, you'd be laughed right out, right? And then he says, um, further down, it's becoming evidence that everything gets along without God. This is what I was saying. This is closed universe. We look around, and if I don't believe in God, my life goes on exactly the same as if I did. Now, it might make a difference for me personally, how I choose to live uh, in my own psychology, in my own practices, but it's not as if, oh, I quit worshiping God and now suddenly my car gets struck with lightning all the time. That doesn't happen. That is, and because those things aren't happening, they're saying, well, you know, I took God out of the equation and nothing happened. And if nothing happened, then we're fine, right? And um, so, <coughs> excuse me. All right, let's get to the next slide. We'll read through this. Roman Catholic, <coughs> excuse me, and Protestant historians agree that it is in this development that the great defection from God, from Christ, is to be seen. And the more they claim and play off God and Christ against it, the more the development considers itself to be anti-Christian. The world that has become conscious of itself and the laws that govern its own existence has grown self-confident in what seems to us to be an uncanny way, false developments and failures to not make the world doubt the necessity of the course that it is taking or of its development, they are accepted with fortitude and detachment as part of the bargain. And even an event like the present war is no exception. Okay, there's a lot of philosophy and stuff in here. I'll try to unpack it without getting uh, too heady. All right, but he's talking about uh, the development is the great defection, the great defection from God. He says Protestants and Catholics agree that this is what's going on. Uh, <laughs> the great defection from God. And what is causing the, the great defection? Again, this is the closed universe. People fall away from God because there's no need to fall in with God. Life goes on without God, right? Life goes on fine without it. It's like me and astrology. I don't consult astrology. I don't I, I think I'm an Aquarius, okay? Um, you know, I don't think I'm going to bring on the dawning of any great age. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we, we tried that. I, I live my life as if, 
as if the alignment of the stars made no difference, and as far as I can tell, there's, it makes no difference. So I don't feel any need to have to go back to the horoscope and find out uh, whether an Aquarius will fall in love today. You know, and I think that's the same way that I view that, is how secular people view religion. I just, I don't pay attention to it, and it doesn't make any difference, right? And so, and so people are defecting, all right? Uh, and then it says, uh, and the more they claim put of God, the development considers itself to be anti-Christian. So, to teach people to see the world like a scientist with a closed universe view, what ends up happening is they end up pushing people away from Christ in order to enable that. It's a little bit like, even if it's only done as an intellectual exercise, so you sit in the classroom and you're studying, okay, why did the earthquake happen? And somebody raises their hand and says, well, it's God's punishment on Turkey for doing something. I don't know. And the teacher would immediately say, let's suspend that belief. Let's bracket that. Let's push that aside. And let's work on the assumption that there is a material explanation for this. Right? So we're pushing aside the God hypothesis and pushing back a materialist hypothesis, right? And so that's what they would do. But what, they, what it ends up looking like is you're pushing Christ out of the way, you know? And, and many scientists would argue that that's the only way I, you can get people to, under, to think scientifically because as soon as they say, well, the God or the gods did it, then you stop looking for other answers. Uh, one of the classic examples was in ancient Greece. There's a river on the Turkish side, what's now the Turkish side, uh, in Asia Minor. And now the city, and I can't remember what city, is way farther back from the coast than it used to be because so much silt has gone down and the river changes course, as rivers always do. And they studied this, and one of the first big scientific experiments is when they started observing that it was the silt coming down the river that changed the course, not the gods. And Tyson's argument is that if people would have just attributed the changing river to the gods, they never would have bothered to, learn, to try to learn about silt. And so the scientists become anti-Christian in that sense, right? So then what ends up happening? They end up being put in opposition. And so Christians who don't believe in the closed universe can get prickly and react. And, um, and then they'll say, see, you're being defensive and closed-minded. And, they'll, and then they'll respond back, well, you're being closed-minded to the possibility that God did it. And so what ends up happening? Well, fundamentalists then will come along and feel like since they're pushing God away, we're going to push God back, right? That's kind of the fundamentalist response, double down. So, if, so what we're going to do is we're going to sow doubt in science itself. Right? If scientists are going to claim, be so smug and self-assured that the world really truly does run without God, what we're going to do in order to protect God is to get the kids to question whether scientists really know what they're talking about. And, and maybe scientists are, uh, know, know as much as you think they know, and maybe they're overstating their case. And I'm sure there are some who overstate their case, right? Uh, it's one thing to say, my working hypothesis, I don't have evidence for God, versus asserting in the strong claim, there at definitely is no God. There is a difference between that. Um, but what the fundamentalists do is go and try to sow doubt. Well, maybe the scientists don't know. You know, it's just a theory. You know, they haven't actually proved that. And so they sow doubt. They sow doubt about science. They sow doubt about academia. They sow doubt about any research. They, they, they aren't going to try to go and disprove it. You know, trying to disprove Stephen Hawking's theory is going to have to take you years of study, right? That's way too much, way too hard for you to try to disprove him on his turf. What you can do is say, well, can you really trust it? Like reasonable doubt, like this is a court, right? So your goal isn't to produce evidence that overwhelms it, it's to get people to have doubt. And so this is what you saw a lot with COVID, right? And you had a lot of very religious, conservative religious people, a lot of fundamentalists, assuming that when these epidemiologists and public health people were making statements about COVID that 
They might be part of some shady cabal. Or do scientists really know what they're talking about? Or, well, you know, he said this one time, but then he said something else the next. Can you trust him? And all these are exactly the tactics that a defense lawyer would use when, you know, well, you don't know if my client, you, you, can you prove that my client was actually there? You know, well, just because there's blood all over, do, do, can you prove that? How do you know the, the, how do you know the police aren't really trying to frame you? And the job of the defense lawyer isn't to produce evidence to prove my client is innocent. It's just to sow doubt. And so that's what was going on. As soon as these public health experts started talking, they were sowing doubt. Why are they sowing doubt? Because part of the fundamentalist response is rather than let scientists and academics push God out of the universe and continue to convince people that it's a closed universe, you sow doubt about the authority of their claims, you sow doubt about their motives, you sow doubt about their agendas, and so you get people to not trust them. If they don't trust the scientists, now it's easier for you to insert some sort of fundamentalist doctrine like um, the dinosaurs, right? You know, if you're a person who really truly believes that either dinosaurs walked around with people or that God just put the dinosaur bones in the ground for the fun of it, uh, you know, you, you can't, it's hard to prove that with evidence, but if you can sow doubt about the paleontologists, now you've opened space for people to insert God in there, right? That's part of the project. That's part of the pushback. And um, so, well, he keeps going on here. False developments, false developments and failures to not make the world doubt the necessity of the course that it is taking or of its development. So, in other words, it hasn't worked. At least in Germany at that time, it hasn't worked. I think it's been more effective in America to convince people that scientists are probably out to, uh, somehow out to uh, lie to you. It hasn't worked as well in Europe. Um, and trying to get people to doubt the claims that of science and secularism, it isn't working, right? It just isn't working. Um, and uh, so what does it say? They are accepted with fortitude and detachment. So there's almost a sort of a pride, you know, I'm, 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 I don't need God, I know I don't need God, right? Asserting yourself, almost getting cocky. And of course that cockiness can rub off and create a reaction, right? But uh, it's like nothing shakes their non-faith. Okay, as I, as I mentioned, um, <coughs> just a couple responses to this here. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, one idea is fundament is uh, we were talking a little about fundamentalism, uh, sowing doubt in science. Um, and uh, the fundamentalist attack on science, uh, let me see here, I'm, I'm getting messed up with my notes. Um, all right, uh, what was I gonna talk about? Uh, okay, yeah, this is what Bonhoeffer was talking about before. You can tell with my cold here, my, my brain's still foggy. I promise I don't have COVID. Um, yeah, we're still on the same slide. He was talking about being in the center of creation, uh, talking about putting God at the center of creation. And uh, it was an interesting concept. I've thought a lot more about that since that time. The idea that we can experience God in creation, that's part of what Bonhoeffer's arguing, is that we're, if we position God only in the negative space, after we don't have answers, after we don't have solutions, after we lose our smug, cocky self-assuredness, if, if God only exists in that space after life, then God's going to basically be pushed out of existence, at least in people's minds. And the, uh, the response of Bonhoeffer isn't we need to sow doubt in scientists and convince people that they're all in a shady cabal. The answer is to move God back into the center. And so there's an idea that it's called resonance. And I wish I could remember the name of the guy who came up with the idea. He says it's the only way to sort of break the secularist a bubble, the buffered self. It's the only way to get through that crack, he says. It's where you experience something in this life and in this world that is like so full that the fullness exceeds what you would, what you would just get through sheer materialism. 
So instead of it being beyond creation, it's in an excess of creation. Instead of it being after life, it's in an excess of life. Instead of it being uh, the opposite of pleasure, it is to be found in the excess of pleasure. You can th think of that, again, I was <clears throat> online and there was an old French, it's old now, I think they were early 2000s, there was a French Christian disco group named Justice. And they would, uh, on their stage, they would put up all the speakers and they'd have a cross in the middle of it. They called themselves a Christian group. Now, I've listened to their music. I haven't figured out what's particularly Christian about it. But um, I remember a guy talking about how he went to the concert and how it, it was this spiritual experience. All the people, all the music, everybody dancing. I'm sure there were no mind-altering substances anywhere to be found. But... It was, it, was, it was an experience of fullness, right? The, the experience was fullness. Lots of ecstasy, lots of people, lots of absorption. That, 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 and it was in the fullness where he said he had a spiritual experience. And uh, mind-altering substances, they kind of do the same thing. They operate on that same premise, right? Aldous Huxley doesn't say that when you take your mescaline, it takes you out of the world. He argues it takes you deeper into your mind to all the stuff that's been hiding. It's more fullness and more experience, even though he admits at the end of his book, if I did this, I'd never get anything done. All I'd sit and do is stare at everything and feel how meaningful it is. But the point is he's finding the spiritual experience in the creation, right? It is in the experience of pleasure and of ecstasy that is where one experiences God in creation. And how much of Christian theology throughout history has been based in piety on the opposite, right? Pleasures are the, always the first step towards temptation. The goal of this life is to deny yourself pleasures so, today so that you won't get tempted to sin, so that you'll get heaven after you die. So everything is about is about live your life in the negative now and then in the negative space you'll get something good there's nothing in this world right and secularists are saying i want to experience in this world and i, I will, and so the, well, the argument goes that the best way forward for churches is to stop obsessing about the negative space and re create these sort of resonance experiences and i think a lot of charismatic worship does that. A, a good traditional worship can do that too, but it's a similar kind of idea that people look at it and people start, they see people speaking in tongues and they think, oh, they're, they're leaving the world in some sort of uh, abandonment. But I think what they're doing is the exact opposite. They're doing what that guy was doing at the Justice concert. They're being absorbed in the ecstasy of the moment and there's a fullness. And right now, charismatic churches, Pentecostal churches are the ones growing in the world. And I think they're growing because people are experiencing fullness of God in this world. And the spiritual experience isn't attempting to say, make a claim about dinosaurs or abortion or any of these things. It's just, it's a claim, it's an experience that there, it's a resonance experience. So that's why I always say as, as churches now, we have to reconsider our strategies that we're not so much about teaching correct doctrine as creating experiences. But that's, of course, a higher bar, and we're not set up to do that for the most part, right? We set up our youth programs, our confirmation classes. It's to teach kids, right? It's to teach kids the right, what's right and wrong. It's not to create an experience of the fullness of transcendence in creation. But it's worth rethinking because when people experience that fullness, they come back for it. Okay, now I'm ready to switch to the next slide. Uh, let's, let's go on to slide, I think it's 18. Uh, no, 19, 19, all right, thanks. Okay, here we go. Christian apologetic has taken the most varied forms of opposition to this self-assurance. Efforts are made to prove to a world thus come of age, that it cannot live without the tutelage of God. Even though there has been surrender on all secular problems, there still remain the so-called ultimate questions, death, guilt, to which only God can give an answer. 
and because of which we need God and the church and the pastor. So we live in some degree on these so-called ultimate questions of humanity. But what if one day they no longer exist as such? If they too can be answered without God? All right, apologetics, if you're not familiar with how that, the, the idea of Christian apologetics is to prove God, to make arguments for God, to make the case for God. That's what apologetics is. I've read more than one book, even by evangelicals, that are saying it's time to forget about apologetics. You're never going to argue an atheist into faith. They might experience something that makes them rethink it, but you're never going to argue, argue them into faith. But in 1930s, 40s Germany, apologetics was still running strong within Lutheran and Catholic circles. And one of the things that they, they took as their target was this sort of smug, cocky self-assurance that I don't need God. I am good. I am good without God, almost like I've risen above that. Right? I'm more enlightened because I don't need God. I'm not like you, you know, weak-minded people with your crutch there. And so the effort then of apologetics becomes to say, well, you're self-assured now. You're cocky now. You think you got it now. But what are you going to do if something bad happens? What are you, what are you going to do when you die? What are you going to do? How are you going to deal with this horrible guilt you feel over what you did last summer? Um, and so again, they're trying to erode the cockiness by claiming that, look, you, you, you don't have it all figured out. And it's true, you know, you, nobody has it all figured out. But the secular answer is not, oh, that's true. You know, I don't have it figured out. I guess I better go to church. The answer is, I don't have it figured out, but I'll, I'll, I'm good. I'm good not knowing. I, I don't think most people who are truly secular, spend a lot of time digging deep into the nature of what that means. You know, it was Jean-Paul Sartre who said, most atheists do not stare into the abyss and bear the full weight of the responsibility of a finite life without God. Uh, his argument was most atheists are kind of, they're functionally Christian. You know, they, they, they follow the morals and the traditions of Christianity. They just don't really believe in the God stuff but they haven't actually sat down and really contemplated what does it mean if this is all there is. And I think he's right. I don't think most people in the world spend their time contemplating their non-being. There's Jean-Paul Sartre and Ben Gibbard from Death Cab for Cutie, and that's about all that's left of people who spend all day contemplating death and nothingness. Um, Right? Death Cab for Cutie. They just, their new album. I was, I was listening to their new album. They got a line right on there, and the guy says, I was list watching this movie from the 50s, and my first thought was, all those people are dead. Like, that's how you start your song. Who starts their song that way? Right? Death Cab for Cutie starts their song that way. But most people don't live their lives that way. Most people don't live their lives worrying about it. It's, it's kind of a non-reflective existence. And so hoping that you can catch people when they start reflecting on the, the great deep um, that's going to swallow them up, you're not going to get them because they're not thinking about it. They're not worried about it. it, it, it there's, no, there's no fear and trembling, right? Uh, and so he says, so we live in some degree, in some degree we live. Um, uh, come on, I lost it. Man, I'm having a tough time today. Um, so we live to some degree on these so-called ultimate questions. So the church is living on the ultimate questions. What do we do if, they already, if the questions don't exist? Well, it isn't like everyone's, you know, atheists have solved the question of the meaning of life. It's that people aren't asking the question. They just aren't asking it. And if they aren't asking it, then you don't really have a place to, you don't have a place, right? And I do think there's a, a valid critique here that Bonhoeffer's pointing out, and it can really look like he's church bashing, um, you know, that he says, God, to which God, only God can give an answer, and because of which we need God and the church and the pastor. Uh, you know, convicting, I'm the pa I am one of the pastors, right? Uh, but he's saying the church is trying to keep itself in business by being the thing that provides the answer to these ultimate questions. And if you read 
uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, he would say, what is, one of the, what, what, what is the natural reaction that we have when we look into the abyss? It's anxiety, right? We get anxious. We don't know. We can't see. It's an empty void. We're going to cease to exist. That the emptiness, the lack, creates anxiety in us. And so we seek to alleviate that anxiety. And an unscrupulous pastor could take advantage of that in somebody and be the solution, the filler for their anxiety, right? So if you have somebody who's chronically worried about everything, if you can just shower them with enough attention and validation and make them feel needed enough, again, in an unscrupulous way, there are, there's nothing wrong with being a good friend or a, a taking care of someone, but in an unscrupulous way, it becomes a way to take advantage of people's neediness and, and have them glom onto you as you then fill that neediness with the reassurance they need. That you're, you're filling the, the angst in their lives with validation. But of course, what happens when you do that is you haven't actually taken away the questions and the things that are causing that neediness, that anxiety, that loneliness. You, ha you haven't actually fixed the problem. You're just sort of covering it. The hole is still there. You're, you're just having them fill it with your attention and validation, which can become then codependent, almost addictive. And so there's, a, there's an unscrupulous, darker side to that that can be uh, where things can go. But he's basically saying that churches in general have kind of made that our business plan. We need to stop making that our business plan. And uh, so now let's go to the last slide. We'll wrap this up. <laughs> oh, my poor... My poor uh, cold mind is bouncing around. Okay, here we go. Of course, we now have the secularized offshoots of Christian theology, namely existentialist philosophy and the psychotherapists who demonstrate to secure, contented, and happy mankind that it is really unhappy and desperate and simply unwilling to admit that it is in a predicament about which it knows nothing and from which only they can rescue it. Wherever there is health, strength, security, simplicity, they sent luscious fruit to gnaw at or to lay their pernicious eggs in. They set themselves to drive people to inward despair, and then the game is in their hand. This is secularized Methodism. So, Yes, so just in case you thought that Bonhoeffer was only picking on the church for not properly grasping with secularism or that it was only unscrupulous pastors who take advantage of people's loneliness and neediness. No, no, no. Uh, he, he goes after, again, think 1930s, existential philosophers and psychotherapists, which is interesting because his dad was a therapist. Uh, his dad was a psychologist, bon C Bonhoeffer Sr. But what he's pointing to is, I think he's coming out of a world of lots of Freudianism, you know, where the belief is there's, all, there's this dark self underneath all of us that, that you may think isn't there, you may think you're fine, but there's repressed, something is repressed, and there's an id under there lurking. And Freud himself was notorious for taking people who had problems that really had nothing to do with repression or darker urges and making them about darker urges. He, he used to treat um, soldiers returning from World War I, right? You know, and sitting in those trenches week after week, bombs over your head, people dying everywhere. Of course that's going to traumatize you. They're traumatized about bombs and grenades and mustard gas Freud was convinced they still hadn't dealt with their sexual urges towards their mothers. And it was this almost bizarre obsession with, again, finding the negative space, right? If we can find the chink in your armor, we can find the hole, find the void, find the darkness, that's where we've got you. And so he's claiming that these philosophers and psychotherapists are taking perfectly happy people and underroding their happiness and sowing doubt in their happiness, the way a fundamentalist sows doubt in science, uh, sowing doubt in their happiness so that as they began doubting themselves, ah, 
now with doubt they won't be so smug and self-assured anymore of their secularism, will they? Now, now they can begin to answer these deeper questions. Uh, if we just knock people off their contented, happy selves, now we can begin to, to do it. And it, it does smack of creating a problem to create a solution. And that's what you don't want to be doing. Again, there's nothing wrong with being there to care for someone in dealing with a problem when there is sin or guilt, when there is a question of, uh, you know, life and a question of life, when there is a question of health. It is a good thing to be there with people in that place. Where it becomes unscrupulous is when you try to use that and instead of helping them to become healthy again, you don't entirely keep the, you, you, you try to almost keep them there in that spot so that they keep needing you. And it's that little bit of that sense that we need to make the whole world miserable so that they'll turn to God. And uh, I, I won't deny that I've sensed that sometimes uh, in some fundamentalists who don't want, say, government social programs to take care of the poor, because the fear is if the government does the job well enough, will they feel the need to come to the, ch will the church's charities still have a place if the government can create a big operation and take care of these problems without us? Well, is the government gonna put us out of business? Or is the government gonna make people feel so safe and secure like they do in Scandinavia that they will smugly go, I don't need God, I got everything good. And you know, so then the, but the answer isn't let's keep people poor and miserable so that they live with their daily finitude and experience their non-being. Uh, and there, as long as we can keep the, the emptiness in front of their faces, we can keep them coming back. That is unscrupulous. The scrupulous answer is, again, to bring that life and health back into it. One of the things I did before I got here uh, at Lord of Grace is my previous call. I was young adults and community outreach. So that, that was my job. I deal with college students and homeless guys. And it was actually a lot of fun. Uh, but one of the things I, reckon, I realized when dealing with 20-somethings college students is that the questions they were asking and the things they were looking into were not things that churches in general were, were responding to. You know, churches had become very good at dealing with questions of sickness, hospitalization, death, aging. Um, and, you know, you imagine yourself being a 20-something. The world is still kind of your oyster. You're asking questions about what is my purpose in life? Where can I find, where can I find pleasure and fullness of life? You're not in looking for a church to help you through your hospital problems. Most 20-somethings don't go to the hospital very much, right? And so church became almost, a, if not done well, can become a place where everything is about pain, grief, loss, and sickness. And 20-somethings are looking for more life, more experience, more opportunity, more fullness. They're looking at giving back to the world and serving and investing in it and making more of it. Uh, you know, churches need to be aware of that that we, you know, we aren't offering more fullness. We're offering a solve for your emptiness. And there's a difference there. The other interesting observation I'll leave you with is, at, down at the rescue mission, one of the things that the residents had to do was community service. And I know that will kind of, and the first time I heard that, I'm like, wait, you're making the homeless guys do community service, you know? But there is a sense in which we are going to, A, we're going to treat you not like you're just a charity case, but as somebody who does have gifts and talents and skills and the ability to make a difference. Uh, so there's a real dignity in that if done well. Uh, but the other thing is we're still investing back in our community. It's not all just going to be about the illness. It's going to be about showing you what you can do and what we can do and becoming a part of something that brings more fullness and life again back into the community. And that's kind of the, that's where it all kind of comes down to, right? Are you trying to build up the community and people and find God in the center, in the fullness, in the excess of pleasure and enjoyment and experience? Or are you trying to find God only in the absence of those things? All right, that's all I got for today. 
Um, I suppose I could go on longer, but my body is telling me not to. And if I have another couple forgetful episodes, this would be a really bad video. So thank you for your patience, for watching in as always. Uh, leave your comments or questions. Um, if there's something I didn't clarify well or that you need more, uh, just leave me a message. And uh, I'll be back next week. Have a great week. God bless.